I'm Caroline, founder of Equitopia. In our quest to better understand how horses learn, in this video we speak with longtime horse trainer John Lyons, equine behaviorist Jody Ambrose, and UC Davis's Dr. John Madigan. The better we can understand how a horse's brain receives, processes, and responds to information and stimuli, the better we can use this valuable information to create effective, compassionate horse training philosophies. What we're trying to do is convey thoughts. Okay, wait there. We're just trying to get the horse to think of the same thought that we're thinking of. And most of the time, we have been pitted against our horse. You know, it's the horse that's trying to get out of it. The horse doesn't like you. The horse uh, doesn't want to pay attention to you. The horse doesn't respect you. The horse doesn't trust you. We've been beat over the head with that stuff. And it's not true. The horse wants the same things you want. Your dressage horse wants the same thing you want. The horse doesn't want to be scared. He doesn't want to spook. You know, I don't want him to be afraid and I don't want him to spook. So I guess we both want the same thing. He doesn't want his head up here in the air where he's scared to death. You know, I don't want his head up there and have him scared. Many times when people say a horse is being bad or stubborn, they're labeling natural or instinctual behavior as misbehavior. Every behavior has a purpose and what drives instinct is survival. The horse has survived as a prey animal evolutionary wise by rapid responses to fearful situations. Quick, sudden, I'm out of here as fast as I can without a lot of thinking. So that doesn't involve studying the situation, looking things over, figuring out the terrain's better over here, or there's a barbed wire fence here. It's a quick, sudden surge of adrenaline right in the brain. The glucose goes up, the ACTH, the cortisol, and then manifests the cardiovascular system. The heart rate goes up, the gut blood flow changes, the blood flow to the muscles, and that heart rate goes through the roof. And these guys are on their way out and there's no thinking involved. Look at any horse that is upset, is not doing what the rider asks, or the person handling the mask, and then ask yourself this question. Is he at peace? Is that horse at peace? And 99% of the time, 100% of the time, the answer will come back no. And what does the horse want to feel like? He wants to feel like this. This is what he wants. So what does a horse at peace look like? Their eyes will be soft, their ears forward or to the side. Their lips should be softly closed, their jaw muscles relaxed. Their body will have slow, steady muscle movement, not too still, not fidgeting. And usually their head will be lower and their respiration will be slow and steady, which can be seen in the relaxed nostrils and slow movement of the rib cage. Horses show stress in lots of ways. Their eyes will be wide and their stare can be hard or distant. Their ears may be pinned backward or tense and straightforward. Their mouth sometimes will be open or their jaw can be clenched. Lots of lip and tongue activity. Body muscles uh, may be tight and perfectly still or constantly moving. Their head may be straight up in the air with bulging neck muscles. Their breathing may be quick and shallow, which can be seen in the movement of their rib cage or often flared nostrils. When we say he's trying to get out of it, he's not trying to get out of it. His life is miserable at that point. When he's not doing what the handler wants, he's getting worked harder, he's getting punished, he's getting hit more, he's being asked more of. He's not getting out of anything. He's getting into a wreck. Spooky is a evolutionary biology that this could be bad, I could lose my life, and if I see something suddenly, the best thing I can do evolutionary-wise is make the most quick, rapid move to exit as I can. And that's all biology. That's not bad behavior. That's biology. When a horse is in a heightened state of arousal, as tends to happen as a side effect of punishment or flooding, they're not in the right frame of mind to learn. For training to be productive, they need to be relaxed and receptive. <laughs> That's pretty fun, isn't it? Good boy. <laughs> when the horse is in a calm state, they're using their cortical functions. So they have olfactory input, they have auditory input, they have visual input, and they can look at things and make some discernible decisions about what they're gonna do and the safety of different things. So when that adrenaline goes off, when the saber-toothed tiger 
response shows up, there's no more assessment and that horse is then mobile and out of there. At that stage, you're not learning anything. There's not gonna be anything. So the question does come up and it's a valid question is, if there's a little fear response, your heart rate goes up, you're curious, what effect does that have on your perception and learning compared to the calm horse? And the calm horse doesn't have to be influenced by adrenaline in the brain that this could turn into something really bad. And then if it looks like it's going bad, then you get a, a bigger surge of response. And again, during that time, you're not gonna have cortical input for analysis and thinking. If you can get them to the point where they have control over their physical response to anxiety and fear, then it brings them into a place where they can learn and where you can give them better coping mechanisms to deal with their stress. So he's gonna be really scared of this because it's reflective and big. The common responses to a horse being scared of something like this are what we call flooding, which is presenting it to them in a way they can't escape from it. And a lot of times stuff like this gets put in the stall or hung in the stall and the horse can't get away from it. When you're doing this flooding, it's very specific to that particular stimulus. Asking the horse to do a certain procedure over a tarp or something like that, it's that one object and that one thing that they've learned, not this concept of uh, more global trust and more global, I'm okay, in this situation with you. So he's choosing to walk around on the far side of the stall and see what happens. He's investigating what it is and figuring out for himself whether it's safe. If I were to throw this at him or put it in his stall with him, he would get overwhelmed by his anxiety about it. But he, right now he has a choice. It's not moving around, it's not doing anything. He can, he can navigate it and participate in the process of figuring out what it is and what it means to him. And if I watch his body language, I can see whether he's getting what we call over threshold, if he's getting to a point where he can't take in information and he can't, he's not gonna get any better. But I know Ripley and I know he's really curious. Light reflection is a big trigger for a lot of horses. They don't see color very well, but they see light and shadow. So something that's more reflective of light is gonna be scarier than something that's got a dull finish. So he genuinely isn't scared of it now because he processed his fear. So instead of him being flooded with fear, we've changed his emotional state into a positive one and now he associates this object with good things and that's going to last. So a great question comes up, can the horse learn in a fearful environment? And by and large, it's pretty clear that learning is really interrupted when you're in a high fear situation across a variety of species. A lot of evidence for that. So I don't have to tell him, don't hold your head up there. I get to show him where he can be at peace and relax with his head. I don't have to punish him because his head is up there. He doesn't want it up there anyway. And his life is miserable up there when he's running around scared to death. In addition, simply punishing unwanted behavior only tells them what you don't want them to do and fails to provide information about what you do want them to do. I don't have to punish him or make him work harder. What I can do is show him where he can be at peace in his life. Now, nose right, hips right. Most of the time, when I say most of the time, I'm talking about 80, 90, 95% of the time, the horse and I want the same thing. The hunch is in. And if I knew that, if I in, inherently knew that, if I drilled that into myself, then what would happen, it would become a huge training tool uh, for me to use. We've learned more about the physiology of the horse and, the, and we look at the evolutionary biology and look at the situations that our horses live in and the environment we place them in, in the cities and the towns, on the trails and the bicycles. We're constantly having to deal with the evolutionary biology and letting the horse get it into perspective. And I think training methods that allow that are the future. It is a huge, huge training tool to know that to know what truly the horse wants in his life. He just wants to be at peace, and he's willing to do anything that we want him to do, go over jumps, canter pirouettes, uh, to do stupid things like spin in circles. 
He'll go on our trail rides. He'll do anything, you know, for us if we let him be at peace.